<coughs> so Frank Close, who I'm sure needs no introduction, um, will uh, give us not the summary talk, but a random walk through big science, which I'm sure will be fascinating. Thanks, Chris. Well, the one thing I should do as the final speaker is actually to thank Joe for organising this, the St. Cross College and the anonymous sponsor, the physics department, and actually all the speakers, apart from myself, because I'm now going to uh, give my own random thoughts, um, connecting some of the things we've heard together today uh, in a different way, perhaps. Um, and I've just picked up four things. The link between Onis and the Higgs boson, a big science problem, and I can't remember if that's a big science problem or a big science problem, but I'll remember. An, an evolving question, and then Manhattan to fusion via an espionage. I made a spurious link between the first talk and the talk on ITER. Um, so let's begin with Onis and the Higgs boson. Peter Higgs, in 1964, was scribbling these equations on the blackboard, which led, as we know, to uh, a huge big science endeavour. Contrary to popular wisdom, he was not trying to get a mass of the W and Z bosons, not least because we didn't know that they existed yet. What really the issue was, was that superconductivity, which had been discovered in 1911, um, the theory of it by Bardeen, Cooper and Schieffer had recently appeared, and there were some weird problems with it that uh, were disturbing people. And uh, it involved the solution to that by a man called Nambu, involved something called hidden symmetry. And uh, that makes my spurious link to uh, Carol's talk, because hidden symmetry, I think the most beautiful example of this is right there in the heavens, in spiral galaxies. Basically, the idea being the f f law of gravity is particles attract each other completely symmetrically in all three dimensions. And therefore, the fact that the sun is effectively spherical and that lots of spherical galaxies are roughly spherical makes sense. But this beautiful example of a spiral galaxy is not three-dimensional. And so there before your very eyes in the telescope is an example that the golden rule of nature is that stability trumps symmetry. And it gives up symmetry to make more stable things. The other part of this story is that although the symmetry is broken on this particular example, on a case-by-case, -case, if you look in the jargon globally, or in this case universally, um, spiral galaxies point every which way. So my small contribution to big science is that presumably if you did a chart of the orientations of all spiral galaxies that you have in your huge database, they would completely be spherically symmetric. And if not, I'll take the credit. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> So, back to Peter Higgs. Um, before the boson was discovered, I mean, one of the messages for big science is that for big projects, you have to have big enthusiasm. You have to have support of funders and support of the public. And that is why outreach is very important. And the Higgs boson, of course, had captured people's imagination, even if they did not know who it was, even if they didn't know who Peter Higgs was. Um, and Peter was a man, or is a man, who's sort of quite shy in a way, but is comfortable on a stage when he's being interviewed. And so a few times in the lead up to this, I talked with him um, on the stage, for one case being at Edinburgh. And the way I sort of introduced it, was like this. So I said, look, in 1964, uh, you were scribbling these equations on a piece of paper, as a result of which we now, this was 2012, have a 27 kilometer ring of magnets under the ground. We have these detectors the size of battleships to record the results. We have collaboration meetings, and that isn't all the scientists involved. That's just some of the scientists who came to the meeting out of one of the collaborations. The sum total has cost about 10 billion euros. If tomorrow you found a mistake in your calculations, would you tell anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so the point of this, which I've now forgotten, I think it's on the next slide. Yes, OK. Um, so it struck me that here is an example of the point that was made in the first talk. Uh, the comment that Goodsmith made, it's not you, but the machine that creates the particles which you investigate with great zeal. And uh, it occurred to me, we have seen today 
mention of the discovery of the antiproton at Berkeley, a machine that was built specifically with the goal of producing the antiproton. That was what determined the size of the thing. And the antiproton was then discovered. And the Nobel Prize was given to the people who discovered what the machine builders had built. But that was how it came about. In this particular case, the LHC was built, the Higgs boson was discovered, and Higgs and Anglais got the prize. But nobody won the prize from CERN itself, which tells me something. I think the thing that struck me more, though, was the point that was made about the, the big size of collaborations and the 5,000 authors that appeared on one paper. And we were all marvelling at that, and I thought, yes, and that doesn't include the engineers, the technicians, the various universities and institutes around the world, in addition to the people who are the scientists whose names appear on the thing. So the total size of the endeavour is vast. And this then brought me to this point. Uh, a question was raised, what do we do next? What, what do we have to do? Is there some sort of goal that we can articulate? And there was some discussion uh, about that. I think the simplest thing is, that if you're able to convince people to build a big machine to go and look for something that you believe is there but others don't, well, go ahead. But I think that there is one thing model independent that one can argue is a necessary immediate step and it's this we have discovered the Higgs boson fine the whole rationale of this is that we have discovered the proof that we are immersed in some sort of plasma stuff call it the Higgs field what that is we don't know the only thing we know about it is that if we hit it at 120 odd GeV it resonates as a particle so we know it's there. What we need to know is, how does it form? What is it? And the first step towards that is, if you could produce in a single collision two Higgs bosons, which then interact with each other and you see what happens, you've got the first step towards, I mean, to draw a terrible analogy, it's like we've discovered a single drop of water. And the real thing we want to know is surface tension. So you need to know how two drops join together to begin to get the picture of the whole. That, to me, is a model-independent general statement of we need to either have enough energy or enough intensity to do that. And that will defend you against people who say, I don't believe in supersymmetry or this, that, and the other. That is what we were doing it for. If you were to stop without doing that, we've been stamp collecting. <laughs> so uh, what happened was, to put this in the other context, uh, is the time scale involved. I mean, I started with Peter Higgs, I said 64. I've called it 65, just to get some nice 50-year things in here. Um, Maxwell, 1865, the classical theory of electromagnetism. I put 1915 for roughly when Rutherford was doing his stuff. 65 Higgs, 2015, the time scales when we discovered the thing. Um, you see these 50-year slices, and what struck me was not so much that it took 50 years to get from Higgs to the, the boson, but that was halfway back to when Rutherford discovered there was an atomic nucleus in the first place. And it was only one third of the way back to Maxwell starting all of this stuff. That was a way that I then began to feel quite uneasy about the expanding timescales that are involved in big science. And I called it big timescales and big sociology. And I think this point was commented on in another context today. I do not know how one will encourage youngsters to come into science if you told them an idea today, and we saw it in the final talk, we're talking about the possibility of a machine that might start getting built in 2030 if we're lucky, and it'll be completed in 2040, and maybe we'll start doing experiments then, which will be done in about 2050, so it'll be 30 years from now before you get the results in, and you'll spend the rest of your life analysing them. That is what a scientific career is going to be. And by the way, there's 5,000 other people with you. And why are you coming into it? These are questions. Um, they'll probably do other things, like solve global warming, which is not a trite remark. I mean, this, the, the, the final discussions were like the, the big, the strategic picture of where are we trying to go. Yes, we're focused on physics today. 
We're making these decisions upon what we would like to think of on the next 10, 20, 30 year timescales in physics. That presupposes we know the answers to what are the real questions society will be wanting to have answered at that time. Uh, anyway, I'm reviewing today's meeting, not looking to the future. Uh, this, the next bit was really to say you can take a single question. There is a single question to my mind which has actually been present throughout the whole of the last century and still today. And the solution to that question has evolved as the nature of science has evolved. And this is one of the questions which was not on the list that we saw of the fundamental questions. And it's a question that is so obvious to me once stated that it, I, I regard it as my question number one. And it's this one. <laughs> well, it's not quite this one, but you'll see what it is. Every breath you take in, and if I'm giving a popular lecture, I say every breath you take in, you've breathed in a million, 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 million atoms of oxygen, and in each of those atoms is negative electrons. And if that was the whole story, the total amount of electric charge you breathe in on those electrons in each breath would be enough to ignite 100 lightning bolts, according to Wiki. <laughs> and of course, the fact that it doesn't is because matter is neutral. And that, of course, is how the whole game started. It was the discovery of the electron with actually a small tabletop experiment by J.J. Thomson in 1897 that identified negative electric charge in atoms. And the question, where is the positive, then drove Rutherford and his colleagues with further small-scale tabletop experiments to find the atomic nucleus and basically answer that question as of the 1920s and 30s. Um, a question which sometimes I'm asked by people is, why were these guys able to do so much with this small stuff and you people having this humongous stuff? Um, and a partial answer to that is that they were trying to understand the nature of matter as it is now, and the universe has spent 13 plus billion years of work getting it into that state for us. And we're doing what's left to sort of look at it. The sort of questions that we're looking at now in particle <coughs> physics is not what is that matter made of, but where did it come from? And that means we have to sort of recreate mini Big Bangs in our experiments, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. 1920, the problem, if that is where science ended, is sort of pretty simple. Well, you've got the electron, which is negatively charged, and we identify the proton in the nucleus, which is positively charged. I'm not sure quite what electric charge is, but clearly you can take it off the electron and put it on the proton and simples. Then, unfortunately, science got bigger, the microscopes got larger, and we discovered the proton isn't the final seed, it's made of smaller things called quarks. And that these quarks, on the average, have about one third of an electric charge, and they all cluster in threes. So the problem now has moved to, why is it that three times one third equals one? In the same units that the electron, which knows nothing about quarks, as far as we know, scores minus one. So we saw the chart of the standard model on the screen early this morning with the electron and its friends and the, all the variety of quarks, and that is indeed how it is. Staring me in the face here, every breath you take, is the fact that electrons and quarks somehow are reading the same story, and yet we haven't got a clue how to answer that. So that, to my mind, is actually a big question. Whether it's requiring big science to solve it, or a small tabletop to solve it, or some smart idea to solve it, I don't know. But to me, that is one of the most obvious questions which is really there. It's the clue that there is something yet beyond what we understand about leptons in the jargon and quarks. So coming back to the remark I said about you know, small table experiments, because the universe spent 13.8 billion years making the matter, with the discovery of the quarks and the fact that they are in many ways somehow related to the leptons, emerged in the 70s and the 80s the insight that back, if you could, that we are living in a sort of cold remnant of asymmetry where way, way back in the very heat of the Big Bang, you would have the real story being shown and LEP and later the LHC, colliding these beams at CERN, in those collisions are recreating the ultra-hot conditions that the universe had experienced itself in the first moments of the Big Bang. So that's what I call the rise of Big Bang science. 
And in many ways, that to me, uh, I mean, that's sort of touched on the career that I have seen, uh, that to me is when the nature of particle physics changed. It changed from trying to understand what matter is made of to where did matter come from. It suddenly became what I might call experimental cosmology. So it was much easier to explain to the public why this was something exciting and worth following. And I think it is fair to say that up to that time, when particle physics was getting messier and messier, the support for it and the effort you had to put in to convince the fund funders that this was worth supporting was getting exceedingly difficult. Suddenly, with this insight that at CERN and likewise, you are recreating the aftermath of the Big Bang, I mean, you've got it made. And suddenly the support came and we ended up with LEP and the LHC. So that is the qualitative difference. Right, the last point um, is the link of the first talk, which I thought was going to have the Manhattan Project in it, but it sort of passed by, um, and the third talk on ETA. Um, and this has got nothing to do with anything except I wrote a book about it recently. I thought I'd tell you about it. It's much more interesting than anything else you heard today. <laughs> so here we are. This is, an, this is a photograph of the Trinity test of the original atomic bomb. Um, and when I was researching the famous or infamous spy Klaus Fuchs, here in the Bodleian Library, I discovered some papers in Rudolf Piles' collection. Rudolf Piles was one time the professor here, and he, back in 1940, was the person who had the insight that if you could make uranium-235, a grapefruit would be enough in size to make an explosion. And that was the moment when the Manhattan Project, as it later became, began. So in his papers, um, I found some correspondence which I was totally surprised by. And it answered to me a question that I had never understood before. Um, well, what I'm going to show you is a new piece of espionage uncovered in the Bodleian that links G.P. Thompson, Fusion, and ETA. And I had never understood why it is, or was, that when the idea of fusion for producing energy first came up back in 1946, it was classified a secret. I mean, there's nothing very harmful about that. I'm, I'm not talking hydrogen bombs, I'm just talking about good old casual fusion. Well, here's the answer. On the 8th of March 1946, I found this letter from G.P. Thompson to Rudolf Piles. Dear Piles, they were very formal in those days, uh, I send you herewith a manuscript in the hope that you will look through it. It contains an idea on the generation of nuclear energy from deuterons. In fact, this is the moment that Thomson had the idea of what we now call the Z-pinch. And basically, he's written to Piles, because Piles is a theorist. Thomson wants to make sure he's not making a fool of himself. But also, <coughs> he's seen a security problem, and it's this. It would be a formidable source of plutonium using very little uranium. His point was, deuterium and tritium produce, not just energy, but they produce helium and neutrons with 14 MeV energy. And the name of the game in 1946 for the British totally secret atomic bomb project was to breed plutonium in a huge nuclear reactor, which was mentioned earlier, up on Windscale or whatever it was called, Sellafield in those days. And Thomson's insight was that by using this process, you could produce 14 MeV neutrons, and if this worked, it would be a much easier and faster way of breeding plutonium than to do it with the reactor route. Now, of course, we all know what happened. Fusion has turned out to be rather more difficult in practice than they thought back then, but that is the reason why it was classified secret. Okay, park that in one little part of your mind, and we'll go to the next part of this story. Totally unrelated to this, in Parles' correspondence, I found a letter sent the next day from a student called Jerry Gardner. You'll never have heard of him. He was a student at Southampton University who wanted to join Piles at Birmingham and do a PhD. And he was accepted. <coughs> and he was put to work by Piles on some aspects linked to Thomson's idea. And he wrote his thesis, and his thesis was submitted by the University of Birmingham, and he got his degree. We know he got his degree because this interesting letter in 1948 to the registrar confirms that herewith please receive Dr. Fuchs's report on Gardner's thesis. This is Dr. Klaus Fuchs, the infamous atom spy, who has been the examiner for Gardner's thesis on this project linked to Thomson's fusion idea. Um, 
Fuchs was eventually discovered to have been spying and arrested in February 1950. In January 1950, um, by chance, Gardner writes this letter to Rudolf Piles. Dear Professor Piles, I have come across a Russian paper which appears to cover substantially the same ground as my thesis. Just to say, join the dots. <laughs> um, which then brings me to the last things, which is uh, some thoughts that I came up with. The Manhattan Project. I mean, the irony, I love the pie chart that was shown with the total cost of the project and how it broke down into the different parts. And one billion US dollars uh, was applied to enriching uranium-235, either by diffusion or by electromagnetic separation. So that was one billion dollars spent on that. Um, and Fawkes told the USSR how to make a plutonium bomb. In fact, plutonium bombs became the name of the game. After Hiroshima, that was the, the one-off. So all this money was spent enriching uranium. Turns out plutonium was the root. The other thing that I found which astonished me touches on another question that was asked. There was some discussion about you know, the motivations of the scientists and what they felt about uh, the atomic bomb and, and so forth. Um, one thing I always think about this is don't forget the fact that these famous people, as we remember them, were actually at that time probably about 28 years old. They were a very different generation than when we got to know them later. But that said, I discovered there are some lectures that Fermi gave on the hydrogen bomb, totally secretly, at Los Alamos, which are still classified secret in the UK, but the Americans managed to uh, agree to a freedom of information request and release them. And I discovered that Fermi gave a series of lectures spread over several months on the physics of how to build a hydrogen bomb, the possibilities of it. And the astonishment to me was the first lecture he gave was on the 2nd of August, 1945. That is, within days of the Trinity test of the atomic bomb having worked, and yet we hadn't even got as far as Hiroshima happening. I mean, the, the key bit of physics you probably need to know here is to make a hydrogen bomb, a fusion reaction happen, you have to have high temperature. And an atomic explosion creates high temperature. So the idea was to use an atomic explosion as the spark to ignite the hydrogen explosion. So here you have Fermi having seen the successful atomic test take place, suddenly, in a way, myopically viewing the, the, the scientific wonder, the engineering beauty, putting quotes around this, of what has been achieved, seeing that we can now apply this to make a hydrogen explosion. <coughs> that tells me something about Fermi. I'm not quite sure what it is, but uh, that was quite a shock to me to realise the speed with which he picked that up. It touches on a question that I asked at the end of the first lecture as well, about the relationship between the science as it was emerging after the war and the military. I don't mean that the scientists were working knowing on military things. My question was more, what did the politicians think they were buying? Uh, for example, neutrinos, which we've all been talking about today. Uh, the first paper back in, well, Bruno Pontecorvo, a man who was working on the Manhattan Project in Canada, building the first heavy water reactor, had been a student of Fermi's. Fermi had come up with the idea of picking up the idea of the neutrino and applying it in a theory uh, of beta transitions. Pontecorvo had the insight, nuclear reactors should be, theoretically, a wonderful source of neutrinos. Maybe that could be a way to look for them. And he wrote a paper in 1945 on how to detect neutrinos produced from a nuclear reactor. And I see people nodding. You're probably all aware of the 1946 talk he gave on this. My shock when I went to the archives to try and find that was to discover he actually wrote a paper in 1945 which was classified secret for 40 years. And the reason was this, with hindsight. If indeed it was possible to detect neutrinos easily, I mean, we know now it's difficult, right? But if it was possible to detect neutrinos easily, you could go around into some enemy country and work out the power of their nuclear reactors by detecting the neutrinos. That was why it was classified secret. We, we now look back and say, well, that was nonsensical. But at the time, it was sensible. And it shows to me that there was this very delicate interplay between what the particle physicists, as we now call them, were uncovering about the possibilities in nature 
and what you might be able to do with it, or perhaps more, what they might do with it if we don't do it first, that sort of thing. Which brings me on to the background of my question, because it wasn't the discovery of the pion as such, it was the fact that having discovered the pion and confirmed Yukawa's prediction that the these sort of virtual pions make an evanescent web that holds nuclei together. This was the, the agent of the nuclear force, if you like, and you now produced it. You could now make beams of pions at accelerators, use these beams to irradiate nuclear targets, and investigate the real nature of the nuclear force. The possibility that what we had just done with the atomic bomb and the ideas on the hydrogen bomb could be just the metaphorical tip of an iceberg, and that we could now <coughs> get something really out of the nucleus, and if we don't do it, maybe they will. To what extent that was one of the motivations for the funding? So that was what I say at the bottom here. What did the politicos think they were buying? And I don't know the answer to that, but it's a question I think which is relevant. It's relevant in part because the beginnings of big physics as we now know it, in particle physics at least, certainly grew out of the success of the nuclear physicists at Los Alamos. The beginnings of radio astronomy, I think, trace back to the knowledge that was developed during radar. Um, so that was a time when scientists were perceived as heroes because of what had just happened, and it was a very good time to be funding the big projects that, that led forward. And as somebody said to me, it was a very time of optimism, that people felt the scientists could do stuff. So uh, I feel that my summary of where I think things are going to go, um, this is not the thing to do, but anyway. Particle physics, I said, emerged from cosmic rays, and under cosmic rays it will return. By that I mean it was the discovery, not just of the pion in cosmic rays, but then the strange particles in cosmic rays, which revealed there was much more going on in the cosmos than we have been aware of so far. And the motivation, or the scientific motivation, behind the birth of particle accelerators was to replicate cosmic rays on Earth under controlled conditions. It was mentioned with the neutrinos that we are now detected neutrinos of vast energies. So nature is producing these things, and if you've got a big enough detector, maybe you can capture them. It's in that sense that I think that uh, cosmic ray physics will be uh, a thing with improvement in detectors. I could imagine the idea of developing detector technology for much, much less than the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars that you're going to have to convince somebody to build a machine that maybe or maybe won't find something and that the kid's going to spend 50 years working on. Gravitational, and neutrino astro gravitational wave and neutrino astronomy, I think without a doubt, is a future uh, that we can see. It's going to access uh, the cosmos in a way that electromagnetic spectrum does not. Um, and the last thing, I mean, radio astronomy, I've always felt, I mean, the return to the moon was, was mentioned. Yeah, if you've got astronauts on the moon, why not build a radio a telescope on the far side? It's the one place in the universe which is completely blanked out from, from all the noise here. Uh, so that's pretty well all I've got to say, other than if you want to know the real story, <coughs> you need to read that. Okay, <laughs> thanks for now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank, for a brilliant summary talk. It wasn't exactly a summary talk. But I, and Frank has kindly agreed to answer questions, and I can't imagine there won't be some after what we just said. Yeah. If you had a sufficiently sensitive neutrino detector, could you find the location of every nuclear submarine on Earth and therefore make the nuclear deterrent not work anymore? I'm a theorist. But uh, <laughs> I'm not aware of any fundamental principle that says you could not. But uh, there's many practical reasons to say you won't. <laughs> um, uh, it's a technical question. Why are there only eight gluons and not the ninth one? I'm sorry, I'm an amateur physicist. No, no. Um, it, I can give you a mathematical answer. It turns out that the... Ma The, the theory, electromagnetic... Could, the equation of the... Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, well, let me, just, let me just try this. So you can describe electric charge with a number. Yeah. 
move to two rather than going to... Th if you've got a two by two matrix, then you've got four entries. Yeah. But these are special matrices where the sum of the diagonals adds up to nothing. So there's only three, and they correspond to the W plus, the W minus, and the Z naught. That's called SU2. Yeah. Same with three by three. Three squared, take away the one from the diagonal, gives you the eight. Yeah. So if you like the, the, the missing ninth, if you want to think of it as like the photons. Does it exist then, or is it something that's so stable or unstable that it never exists? Or, I mean, you've described it mathematically, but it, it could still... No, okay. It doesn't exist at all. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. well, I mean, in, the in the framework of a world of only gluons described by SU3 there are eight of them the big picture is SU3 SU2 times U1 I mean, the, the U1 if you like is the missing bit yeah. and the, the photon has those characteristics it doesn't feel the strong forces and, and so forth yeah. okay. I'm getting a bit simplified but... no, no, no. Okay. the thing to hang on to is 3 squared minus 1 is 8 <laughs> yeah. and 2 squared minus 1 is 3 I mean that's the yeah. thing yeah. Uh, the presentations today were all focused on big sciences, as if it is its, in its own term. Uh, but besides these big sciences, we also have, uh, since 1960s, emerging cluster sciences, such as life sciences, data sciences, computer sciences. Uh, uh, I mean, presentation didn't much refer to them, uh, as if it is independent of itself. But what big sciences exist on its own without this uh, modern cluster sciences? Well, uh, as I said earlier, this talk is supposed to be about physics, but the problems that I've touched on, on the sociology of big sciences, I think certainly apply to these other areas. For example, the Human Genome Project. I mean, that certainly qualifies as big science. Um, the discoveries there certainly qualifies what you might call Nobel Prize science, but the nature of the Nobel Prizes are limited to three individuals. And of course, Nobel founded those back in the 19th century when science wasn't like it is today. So if Nobel Prizes were the be-all and end-all of things, which they're not, but you can see that's an example of something that was created to give awards to things which don't really apply well. So the sociological questions are certainly common, I think, to all what you might call, if by cluster sciences you mean where lots of people from lots of institutions have to come together and share individual specialities to make the, the whole work. This is a completely different sort of question. I was delighted you drew attention to archives, mm. because archives are extremely important in putting things right long after people have thought differently. Um, I was at a meeting 40 years ago at the Royal Society, the Royal Society Committee, um, where um, a professor from Oxford, whom I will not name, said that papers only of fellows of the Royal Society should be preserved, and those, and I was arguing that technicians' papers are equally important in, because they produce the machinery. Um, that's all I want to say. <laughs> I'm not going to do it No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that's an interesting, I think that's a fair, fair point, that, uh, that for historians who are trying to reconstruct the real story of progress, I mean, you, you get this sort of wig, this sort of impression that science proceeds like this, whereas, of course, we all know a lot of it's sideways, some of it's backwards, and identifying who really had the insight, because, touching on your plus, what we were talking about a moment ago, when we were talking of clusters of thousands, even in groups of three or four, you know, an idea emerges from the conversations, and then to actually make the apparatus work. I mean, I'm a theorist, but I can imagine for the experimentalists, <coughs> Chris can tell me more than, than, than I can say here, but how much really was you, the experimentalist, or the technician who put the bits and pieces together? Yeah. Yeah. Well, going back to school days, the glass blower that gave yeah. you the tube. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. That was high energy, high density, absolutely wonderful. I have two questions, if I may. Question one, why do you think Heisenberg failed? Were in, in what Man Manhattan Project succeeded? Was it about the sheer volume of resources that they threw at it? Was it about the diversity of the talent? Or was it about a certain environment where you know, the, the science, scientists were able to question each other in a way that nobody in Nazi Germany could really question the great Heisenberg? Um, and, and sort of following from that, does that mean that the big science, really, and it's a, and it's a positive um, sort, of, sort of thought, has better chance of developing in a more democratic 
um, environments than, than authoritative sort of military. But then again, Manhattan Project was a military endeavor. So that's one question. And the second question is in terms of your question of how do we entice young people to, to pursue physics. Um, my, my sort of observation in, in, in life is that a lot of young people, children, have all these amazing questions about the universe, all this curiosity, and then they go to school, they got taught maths and physics, and they hate the stuff and never want to touch it again. Uh, are we doing something wrong in terms of education? Okay, let's, let's take the Heisenberg one, because of course, the simple answer is I, I don't know, but my understanding insofar as people have been able to reconstruct this, and it also depends how much faith you put upon the farm hall tapes, which was when Heisenberg and the others had been arrested after the war and were overheard, their reactions were overheard when they first heard the news of the dropping of the bomb. They seemed to express genuine surprise at this point. And my understanding of it is that Piles and Frisch here in England had answered the question how much U-235 you need and discovered it's very small. Uh, Flerov, who was mentioned in a, a stamp in the first talk, and somebody else in the Soviet Union, we now know, independently did that calculation and had that uh, understanding uh, within a few months of that. But as far as we know, the Germans never did. And so all the indications that we have is that what the Germans were still stuck with, the discovery of fission in 1938, I mean, there was some discussion of this in the first talk this morning, that by the time the war started, the general understanding was that nuclear fission, if you had tons of the stuff, you could make a, a heat engine, a nuclear reactor. Um, it was, wasn't until the question about pure U-235 was answered that the possibility of a realistic explosion emerged. And it is possible that the Germans were never aware of that. All of the indications, I mean, Jim Baggett behind can probably answer more than that than I, are that they were going on the wrong track. Um, with regards to, sorry, let me just complete because there's three questions there. there. Um, democratic versus uh, non-democratic, um, hard to know. Um, but certainly a question you can ask yourself, if the Second World War had not happened, would we have had an atomic bomb? Because the engineering involved in doing it was so vast, it was all but impossible. We know the Japanese started and never got anywhere for example. The Russians eventually did by 1949 after having been given shortcuts and so on. But it wasn't a trivial thing. It's not the sort of thing you would have set out and completed unless there was a very good reason to do so. Uh, the final thing about children and so forth. Yes, children will, I'm sure, be excited by science. Um, and uh, I hope they don't all become string theorists. Um, <laughs> but, but equally, I hope they don't get disillusioned when they discover that, that uh, the wonderful experiments they did in the lab is going to be rather different from that in the reality, but I'm not an experimenter, so I don't actually have that hands-on feel of what the sociology is really like there. We're nearly out of time. Is there a quick final point that anyone would like to make? If, oh, here. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask you for a personal view, actually, because I feel at the, at the end we've, we've, we've come to an area around espionage and treachery, uh, and a lot of the day has been about collaboration and trust. Um, I mean, from my point of view, I've really enjoyed the, the, the ITER uh, lecture. I thought it was really promising. I thought it was wonderful, the participant states openly sharing the most valuable knowledge. I just wonder, where, where do you think we are? Do you think we're in a really good position, or it's been better, or what's your view? I, I think without a doubt, um, big science, as it's developed in the, since the 50s, has been a force for good at the sociological and political level. For example, it's been made more than once today. One of the drivers behind founding CERN was to bring European states, which had been at war with each other only six or seven years before, together in a collective enterprise. And I mean, somebody I remember when I was at CERN made the remark, CERN has done more for world peace than it has done for science. <coughs> that was before the World Wide Web sort of thing. Um, so ITER is an example. Uh, Sesame, for example, I think is a remarkable thing. The is it synchrotron light source in Jordan, where you've got Israel and Palestine and the whole Iran, the sort of places that you know, politicians would pull their remaining hair out. But you know, as scientists, we 
this is the norm. Um, you see people for what they can do in science, not from where they come from or who they are. Right. I think we should then just thank Jo and her collaborators and all today's speakers for a, a wonderful meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.